members order. It's time for questions to the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And we'll start first of all with oral questions. Call Dolores Kelly. Mrs. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's question number one to the Minister, please. Uh, consideration of the options for filling the position of Attorney General after the current term ends in May 2014 is underway. Supplementary for Mrs. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Deputy uh, First Minister will uh, recall in the autumn that the First Minister said that he and uh, the Deputy First Minister will be reaching a settled view in relation to the appointment of the Attorney General and would be making an announcement uh, within a matter of weeks. It is now a matter of months, and I wonder what further information can the Deputy First Minister give to this House? Well, I, I can give no further information to the House other than to state the position that we recognise that come May of this year, the position of Attorney General needs to be filled. We have had uh, a discussion about that in the course of the last uh, seven days, and uh, we do hope to be in a position very shortly to make an announcement. Uh, could I ask the Deputy First Minister, Given the issues that the Attorney General has involved him, himself in, uh, does the Deputy First Minister think that he has strayed outside his remit? Well, I think that it's important that we understand the different roles and responsibilities of the uh, Attorney General. When he was appointed, we invited him to undertake the non statutory role of Chief Legal Advisor to the Executive. He also has a range of responsibilities derived from Statute, Convention and Practice, Section 22.5 of the Justice Act 2002 requires the attorney to exercise his functions independently of any other person. There may well be times when the AG in a statutory role acts in ways that others may consider are unhelpful, and there may be times when we as an executive might differ from his views, but it would be wrong for us to seek to curtail his actions when he is acting in his uh, independent statutory role. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to ask the Minister uh, if the reappointment process will take into account the controversial and sometimes unhelpful or inappropriate uh, comments, uh, remarks that uh, he may, he, uh, the Attorney General uh, has made in the past few years. Well, I'm not sure which remarks the member is referring to, but obviously in the course of my initial answer, I made it clear that there were times whenever people did voice objections to what they considered to be his involvement in areas that he should not have been involved in, whilst at the same time we as an executive have to absolutely respect the independence of his office. But what we have to remember is that the Attorney General is a statutory officer with a range of responsibilities, as I said, derived in uh, part from statute and in part from convention and practice. And Section 22.5 of the Justice Act uh, does require the Attorney to exercise his functions independently of any other uh, person. Now, on his appointment, we also invited the Attorney to undertake the non statutory role of Chief Legal Advisor to the Executive. Such a role is uh, usually carried out by the senior law officer in comparable jurisdictions. One of the terms of reference of the uh, Angeloni review was to examine and make recommendations on possible tensions between the attorney uh, having to balance his role as chief legal advisor to the executive with his statutory responsibilities. Paul Frey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Been withdrawn. Okay, no. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number two. Uh, the hash talks concluded on New Year's Eve without agreement between the five executive parties on the proposals that have been put forward. In the absence of such agreement, there has been no assessment or analysis of the cost of implementation. The panel of parties was asked to bring forward recommendations that would provide long-term and sustainable solutions in the best interests of the community and make uh, peace more uh, resilient going forward. It will therefore now be for the parties to agree a way forward, and at that stage it would be appropriate to consider the funding and budgetary implications 
of the agreed measures. Paul Frey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, given the fact that victims were at the heart of Haas, and given the fact that it was the 22nd anniversary of the T-Ban atrocity, uh, and that no one has been brought to justice for that heinous, multiple murder, uh, will the Deputy First Minister, by his own admission, a member and leader of the IRA, will he give all the information that he has to the PSNI to assist the victims and the families of the murder that day? Well, I think that the member takes a great liberty in uh, attributing to me information that I have absolutely no knowledge of uh, whatsoever. Uh, the reality is that in the course of the Haas uh, discussions, uh, there was a huge responsibility on all of the parties to come forward with uh, an agreed approach, which would deal with the uh, issues of uh, victims, uh, the issue of parades, and the issue of uh, flags, symbols, and emblems. And I think that it does a grave disservice to victims if we find ourselves, as a member has unfortunately found himself in a position where he is tempted to score political points. I think what we have to recognize is that we have a duty and a responsibility as politicians to find solutions to these problems. I think we all entered those discussions with a very clear understanding of the challenges that were before us. And I, for one, am not prepared to shirk my responsibilities as a political leader in trying to find outcomes which will be beneficial to victims. And of course, in the context of the Haas uh, recommendations, uh, a menu of options was put forward, which quite clearly could, if implemented, deal with a lot of the concerns that victims have. I think we're all much better working positively and constructively together to find solutions as opposed to engaging in uh, what I consider to be uh, a very low attempt to score a political point. Uh, Jerry Kelly. Mr. Kelly. Uh, would the Deputy First Minister uh, maybe tell us what he thinks the implications are if the parties do not agree uh, on a way forward uh, through the house talks? Well, I have to say I think that there will be implications, and I think there will be implications for victims, implications for communities who are looking at a resolution to the issue of parades, implications also for loyal orders who wish to parade, and implications for people out in society who I think uh, are mature enough to engage in a, a debate around how we respect the British identity in the North and how we respect the Irish identity in the North. These do represent huge challenges. But if we do not find solutions to these issues, and remember, our parties were part of a process uh, called the cohesion sharing and integration process, which saw a lot of good work done. A lot of that good work is now in the approach to the together building a, a united uh, community. And of course, the First Minister and I attended a very important event uh, consisting of a lot of young people and organizations in the Waterfront Hall just a few days ago. Those, those young people are hoping that we can continue to move forward and deal with these situations. But during the CSI, we failed to deal with, the, with those three issues. Some parties play acted. Some parties stepped out of the process. That's why we had to bring Richard Hassan with the agreement of the five party leaders. So it's our responsibility to find a solution to these three issues. Are we going to find a solution to these three issues by repeating the performance of the CSI failures on those three issues? I think not. Leslie Creed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I ask the Deputy First Minister for an assessment of the impact of introducing a whole raft of new quangos um, on the policy of actually reducing arm's length bodies? Well, I, I think that all parties in this assembly accept that the three outstanding issues that we are trying to find resolutions to are issues that require imaginative and innovative approaches. And of course, the dialogue and discussions that took place over a six-month period culminating in intensive talks prior to and after Christmas of uh, last year has left us in a position where, for example, 
the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party told the media that he was 80 to 90 per cent uh, in agreement with uh, the approach that had been adopted in the Haas uh, discussions. And of course, if you're in agreement with 80 or 90 per cent, that effectively means that you are in agreement with the architecture that was being proposed by Richard Haas. I see heads shaking, but I can come to, and I think the public will come to, no other conclusion than that the Ulster Unionist Party, in that statement of saying that they were 80 to 90 per cent happy with what was being uh, discussed in the final days of those discussions, would have realised that much of the discussion centred around the establishment of the HIU and a recovery mechanism and other mechanisms to provide the solace and comfort that many victims groups uh, are seeking. Joe Byrne. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answers. Would the First Minister agree that extra resources may be required from the British Government to implement the Haas proposals? And given that we want to be in a positive frame of mind, how confident is the Deputy First Minister that legislation can be moved in the Dáil, in the House of Commons, and indeed here in due course to make sure that implementation happens? Well, I, I think there's a huge responsibility on uh, the British Government in particular to recognise that in the event of agreement being reached, that they should make uh, a financial contribution towards the establishment of these important bodies to deal with what are very contentious issues within the process. I would contend that whatever price would be paid by the British government would be minimal in the context of resolving issues that cause great aggravation in our community and have, by their existence, uh, created all sorts of difficulties within these institutions. So I, I met with the British Secretary of State uh, recently and that, that issue was raised. I have also raised that issue with uh, the Taunist, Eamon Gilmore, who I have contact with and also met uh, recently. Uh, and I think it is also clear from the interest that has been taken by the White House and by the State Department that there is a very clear recognition in the context of agreement being reached that uh, the British government should make uh, a financial contribution towards the uh, uh, resolution of these issues. In relation to uh, legislation, obviously the big focus at the minute is on whether or not the meetings that we are involved in at party leadership level within the Assembly uh, can find a way forward. Uh, and I think that in the context of finding a way forward, it's then we face into the whole issue of legislating. Sydney Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Hey, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. As members will be aware, the Delivering Social Change Framework was set up to tackle poverty and social exclusion. It represents a new level of joint up working across government to achieve tangible, long lasting social benefits for those who need it most. Underpinning all of this work is recognition of how important it is that all of our children and young people get the best possible start in life. That is why the early work of delivering social change has focused on the identification of the needs of children and families to ensure the most urgent and significant problems in our society are addressed. The initial six signature programmes announced in October 2012 are focusing on early interventions both to tackle issues before they develop into problems and to give children a good start in life. For example, prenatal interventions, early years interventions and programmes for those who are not in education, training or employment. Significant progress has been made in relation to these programmes and they are beginning to make a real impact. However, these signature programmes alone will not eradicate the serious issues which, such as poor health, low educational attainment and chronic unemployment. Reducing intergenerational poverty can only be achieved by all ministers working together with a longer term view to the next programme for government period and the years beyond. We have recognised this and a policy project board has been established to look at how the executive can improve the quality of life for our communities in the areas of health, education, employment, family and community life and cohesion. Through a more joint up approach, we believe we can make changes in children's lives and in doing so we can help break the cycle of multi-generational poverty that blights so many of our communities. Sydney Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And further to that detailed response, can I ask the junior minister what consideration is being given to future projects? Well, there has been a lot of consideration given to future projects, and our, the, the board that I mentioned earlier 
have been looking at, for instance, the activation strategy and have been looking at um, issues co concerning people with disabilities. And recently, you will know that we also had the Delivering Social Change for Children and Young People strategy that's now out for consultation. So we're looking at a number of projects within those particular three, but we're concentrating primarily on children and young people, and we're also concentrating on families as well. Um, can I ask the junior minister what consideration has been given to extending the consultation period for delivering social change on the children and young people strategy? Um, again, just uh, when I said to the previous question there that, that the delivering social change for children and young people strategy does set out um, that was launched um, and is out for consultation, sets out proposed outcomes and indicators and also actions which we hope will improve the outcomes for children and young people. And, uh, although we have said that it was due to close on the 21st of February due to the statutory deadlines, um, we acknowledge that this time period is not in keeping with the good practice as outlined, for instance, by the Equality Commission, so we're hoping to extend that period. But we're certainly, you know, and I don't know if the members had a, a chance to read it, but we are actively um, engaging with uh, people in local communities that have a particular, um, you know, uh, interest in those areas of work, so we will begin out to um, get their ideas to, to sort of um, influence any future policy. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I've listened to the junior minister with some level of uh, confusion. Uh, the, minister, the junior minister will re recall that the, uh, these uh, hubs were to be signed off by the end of January, which we are now in. Has leases been negotiated? And are we going ahead? Sorry, is that the family support hubs or is that the social economy hubs? Sorry, just for clarification. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. Is that order? Yes, I appreciate you know, that, Minister. Uh, I mean, it's no, the, the hubs that were promised by the first and the deputy first minister yeah, to deliver no, social change. Yeah. No, but no, and I mean, I'm not being facetious here. Just, just to answer your question. The community, um, the family support hubs, there has been a bit of difficulty and we had a meeting recently and that was clarified. They were supposed to be in place much more quickly than they were and we're being told that, that they will be in place by um, April of next, this year. Um, this, the social economy hubs, I think all eight and a, a, an extra one, the ninth one, will be in place soon, but the rest of them um, and the locations are there, um, where they are going to, to be as well. So, but I, I take the members' uh, point about the, the family health hubs because we are very, very keen to get those um, in place as soon as possible. Uh, Joanne Dobson. Thank Mrs. You. Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the junior minister for her answer? But um, is she content that the consultation on delivering social change for children and young people will last only five weeks, and I think you touched on this in your previous answer, and that the child-friendly version of the consultation document is not yet published? Well, well as I said, um, we were sort of put under a bit of pressure in terms of the, the statutory deadlines that we have to report to the, the Assembly here under the, the auspices of the Child Poverty Act 2010. And really, you know, we did acknowledge that, that it wasn't in keeping with the Equality Commission's recommendations for consultation. And we're very, very keen because we, we want to, we also, we just don't want to, to sort of consult with the stakeholders and the people who deliver the services. We're very, very keen to uh, uh, consult with the children themselves. You know, um, so I think that, that what we will see, hopefully, is that consultation with the, the children and young people. And we did um, sort of uh, start that off last Friday at the event in the, the Waterfront Hall where we had hundreds of young people coming together. So um, I take you know, what you're saying on board because we're very, very keen to make sure that young people, children and young people are, are actively involved in that also. Barry Megaldoff, Mr. Megaldoff. Uh, question number four, Kesh Divrakyahar. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Mr. McCann to answer this question. We have agreed indicative financial allocations for each of the nine social investment fund zones. Officials have subsequently met with the chairs of the nine steering groups and then with each steering group to agree the projects within each of the area plans which can be funded 
within the available resources for the zone and to discuss the next steps to progress the delivery of these projects. We expect that the first tranche of projects will receive letters of offer in the coming weeks. Officials are currently focusing further efforts on securing approval to those projects which sit within the limits of affordability within each zone but have not yet been fully approved. We acknowledge completing this exercise by the end of the current financial year. Thank uh, Minister McCann for her answer. Uh, can I ask the Minister, now that allocations have been decided, when will groups and projects at local level be informed as to how they have fared in the application process if they are likely to receive funding, essentially now that the allocations have been decided? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I've been taking, I do sympathise with the length of time that some projects ha, have been working, um, and we're hopeful um, that the letter of offers will be going out by the end of next month um, that to some of the lead organisations that will be delivering it. We're very, very keen um, to get that money on the ground because, having come from the community sector myself, I know how frustrating it is um, for community organisations, you know, that, that are constantly um, looking for funding for projects under. You know, we're, we're really um, trying to get it out as soon as possible, and um, I'll keep the member informed of how that's going. Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, will the junior minister uh, and the uh, deputy first minister ensure that at the next round of funding under SIF, whenever they are uh, discussing areas, particularly in interface areas, uh, that accounts will be taken of communities on either side of the interface to ensure that there is a balance in uh, funding applications, particularly in uh, hard-to-reach communities on either side of that interface? Well, certainly. I mean, uh, the, I mean the, we, we are taking, we're taking um, under consideration where the most need is. And that, that, that's where, you know, I mean, we, we want to ensure that all communities have, have the, the money and the resources that they need for to put the services and the projects and the programs in place. It doesn't matter what side of, what, um, side of the community um, that's from. We're looking at this specifically to help people who are disadvantaged and those in most need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Junior Minister for her answer. Could I ask the, the Junior Minister what consideration has been given to rural impacts within the strategic area plans for the SIF? Well, the member will know that, the, that um, the social investment fund was right across the north, and it wasn't, uh, you know, the way neighbourhood renewal is, for instance, um, mainly in urban um, areas. Uh, it, it included rural areas as well. And I think that what we are very, very keen to do, because we know that the, the SIF fund will, will not cure all the ills that's out there, so we're very, very keen to work with other programmes that are already out in the communities and, and you know, neighbourhood renewal and those other, what well, you're talking about, the rural communities and that. So we're very, very keen to work within those area plans as well. But this came from the bottom up, if you like, where the steering groups are deciding what projects and what programmes get this, you know, where, uh, pri are prioritised in terms of getting this funding. So it's really coming from the areas themselves to, um, on the steering groups to decide that. Jim Allister, Mr. Allister. Thank you. After the protracted delay, is it sheer coincidence that OFM, DFM are holding off the announcements of what projects have been successful to get those announcements as close as possible to the local government elections? No, I, don't, I think nothing could, be, nothing could be further from the truth. This is, this, this is, and as I said, I have worked in the community sector myself. I know the difficulties that people out in the community sector have in trying to get resources and funding for programmes and, and, um, and different uh, things that they do there. So this funding, we are trying to get it out as quickly as possible, and we will be doing that. Ian Millen. Mr Millen. Cast over Craig, question five. the whole. Uh, in October 2012, we launched the latest revision of the investment strategy covering the years 2011 to 2021 and envisaging a total investment of something like £13.3 billion. Pounds. The strategy is sufficiently flexible to respond to developments in priorities and policy and changes in the wider economic context, including access to further capital, which was agreed as part of the building of prosperous and united Community Agreement announced in June 2013. In the financial year 2012-13, some 1.3 1, million was invested in capital infrastructure projects 
and I would expect a broadly similar figure for 2013 to 14. During the past year, a number of significant projects have been completed and new ones have been started or commenced in planning. To ensure that we're making best use of the resource available to us, we are currently completing a review of existing infrastructure and assessment of future needs. This will ensure that our investment strategy continues to be informed by the latest evidence. Uh, this has been uh, complemented by innovative research by both the Strategic Investment Board and Queen's University on new strategic infrastructure planning models to assist departments and public bodies and by action to manage property assets more effectively. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Um, can I ask the Minister for an update on the development of the Community Safety College at Desert Creek, Gurumila? Well, I'm sure all the uh, Mid Ulster MLAs will be uh, happy to know that following some difficulties, the two sponsoring departments, Justice and Health, have agreed on the design and costings for the college. It's expected that the contract will be awarded in June, when work will begin on site. Construction is expected to be completed by autumn 2016, and the college will open shortly after that. The total cost of the college, including construction, equipment and ICT, will be in the region of £157 million. In line with our programme for government commitments, the location of the college helps to address regional imbalances in investment and also the inclusion of social clauses within the contract uh, that will provide training, work and business opportunities for uh, local people. I think it's also important to, to state that there will be uh, a Meet the Buyer Day in March 2014. That will provide opportunities for local businesses to become involved, because I think that we're all uh, absolutely agreed that in the context of these huge uh, contracts, it's very, very important that small local businesses are given every opportunity to be in there, uh, uh, seeking opportunities for themselves and for their employees. Patrick McLeod. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for his answer. Uh, could the Minister give us any indication as to why the announcement of the date of commencement has again slipped, um, in that many of us who have been involved closely with trying to advocate this project have seen it slip quite considerably? Then we were told it would be March this year, then it was to be May, and he's just announced June. Well, I think the Member is aware that the Community Safety College is a joint venture between the PSNA, the uh, Fire Service and the Prison Service. Uh, the College, when it is completed, will be a, a world-leading centre of excellence for training. And initial tender returns received in December 2012 were significantly above the pre-tender estimates, resulting in a process to review specifications and designs. And I think that we're all very conscious that that has been the primary reason why we have ended up in a slippage situation. And uh, I have taken as, as keen an interest in this project as anybody, very anxious to see it, because I think that it would be uh, hugely beneficial to people, not just in the constituency, but all over the North, in seeing the decentralisation of these important uh, bodies out of uh, Belfast. Uh, and I think it's also important to state that uh, there were significant elements opposed to this project going to Cookstown in the first instance. And uh, I think that uh, it took people like myself and others to stand against those who would wish to have it in the, the Belfast area. Gladly and happy to say we won the day. And uh, this uh, Centre of Excellence for Community Safety will be built in the Cookstown constituency starting in June. So, Bit of a slippage. I'll accept slippage rather than it not going there at all. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the, the Deputy First Minister how the executive's investment strategy can be utilised, or will indeed be utilised, to remedy the, the disa disastrous uh, effects in many areas in Northern Ireland, particularly in the Irish Peninsula, where there were so many sea breaches, uh, flooding, and um, uh, coastal erosion uh, affecting many people's houses and businesses? Well, obviously, in my, my initial answer, I, I, 
I said that uh, built into all of this is uh, flexibility. And I think that all of us have to be very conscious of the, uh, you know, incredibly worsening weather situation, the extremes of weather that we're now experiencing in the course of uh, recent years. So no doubt those responsible for devising a strategy will have to take account of coast, coastal erosion and how that can uh, be to the detriment of local communities, such as communities in the Arch Peninsula. So I think it is a point well made. Order members, we now move to topical questions. And I call David McElveen. Mr. McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask the Deputy First Minister for an update on the historical abuse inquiry, please. Uh, with your permission, I will ask the Junior Minister McCann to take this question. Well, the member would be aware that, that it, um, there has been recent um, developments in terms of the people now that were affected by historical institutional abuse have now um, been going to Banbridge. And, um, I think that, that really what we're trying to do now is to ensure that the people who do come forward and have to, to go in to, to face that, um, that we will have as much support mechanisms and services as possible for them. Um, at the moment, that, that's what we're concentrating on from uh, the department um, side of things. Obviously, it's an independent um, inquiry, but we're certainly helping and we're very, very keen to make sure that they're supported going through the, the horrendous ordeal that they, they will have to face. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the Junior Minister uh, for her answer. Both the Deputy First Minister and the Junior Minister will be aware um, that the evidence given, this, I think, this week um, or last week by the Sisters of Mercy nuns was described as both haphazard and piecemeal. Um, I wonder, uh, would the Minister be able to give their, her view um, as to her, where she sees the obligations of the institutions such as the Sisters of Nazareth um, in order to cooperate fully with this inquiry? Well, I mean, just to say to the member, um, you know, you've asked for my view, and really, you know, there, there couldn't be anything as more dreadful than what those, those people had to go through, um, particularly the vulnerability of those children because they had nobody to turn to. And really, you know, I have to say that anyone, you know, should be approaching this inquiry, whether on what basis they're, they're given evidence, should be doing it with. Um, you know, an openness and a transparency, and certainly um, I would hope that that would be the case, whatever organisation they're from. Anthony Anderson, Mr. Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I commend that uh, in my question, the turning of the court focus on the new children and poverty strategy, and to ask the Deputy First Minister how he's proposing to take this forward to ensure progress. With your permission, Junior Minister McCann will take this question. Well, again, the member would know just from what we spoke at earlier um, that we have out for consultation um, a new strategy around delivering social change for children and young people. Included in that is the, the child's outcome model that we have been in consultation with uh, stakeholder organisations for some time now. And what we're trying to do, we're trying to base it around the outcomes for children in terms of health outcomes, in ter terms of family support, in terms of, of you know, their educational uh, achievement. So um, we have put this document out now. We are bound by the, the 2010 um, Child Poverty Act from Westminster to make a report to the Assembly by the end of March. That might not be possible. It might slip a bit simply because we want to go out to the consultation and, and to get that information. But that's where it's sitting at, and, and hopefully we'll have more information to bring to the Assembly in the, the coming weeks and months. Cindy Anderson. Thank you. And, for, and further to that, Mr. Speaker, uh, can I ask the, the Deputy First uh, or the Junior Minister, will the strategy be laid in time to meet our statutory obligations in relation to the Child Poverty Act? Well, I mean, I just said, you know, that, that that's what we're hoping to do. Um, it, might, it might slip by a couple of weeks, but that would be all it would be. But we don't want to cut the consultation period short because we're very, very, um, you know, uh, concerned even the equality. Commission's um, view of that as well. But the main thing is we want to consult with as many people as possible, but we also want to consult you know, before we bring that, that back. So uh, um, what I'm saying is that it might slip by uh, a couple of weeks, but that would be all it would be. Question number three has been withdrawn. Jimmy Spratt. Mr. Spratt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can, can I ask the Deputy First Minister, given uh, our commitment to the ongoing Haas process, could the Deputy First Minister outline uh, his view on the next steps? Well, I think the next steps are very clear and they're in the public domain. The uh, party leaders in the Assembly 
have met now on two occasions. Uh, we'll meet again tomorrow. Uh, that will probably be a lengthier meeting than the first two. And I think there is uh, a huge responsibility on all of us to find a way forward on these three contentious issues. Uh, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to be positive and constructive and to recognise that the lot of politicians amongst the general public isn't great. And uh, I find that embarrassing. I think that what we need to do is show the public right across society that we have the ability to tackle these difficult issues. We have tackled even more difficult issues than this in the past. When you look at where all of the parties are now in relation to an inclusive executive, uh, an inclusive assembly, you can clearly see that the challenges that are before us are challenges that can, if resolved, uh, increase the standing of politicians in the public's confidence in our ability to work together in a positive and constructive way. That's the mode I'm in. Uh, my involvement in this process for over 20 years has been characterized by forging agreements with others. And in forging agreements, we all have to recognize that at times compromises have to be made. And I think the compromises that have been made to bring us to where we are today have been honorable compromises. We need to continue to do that in the interests of our people. Mr. Spratt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the uh, Deputy First Minister for his response. Uh, can I further ask him, in light of the Haas uh, deliberations in relation to the past, can the Deputy First Minister join with me in congratulating the authorities for continuing to seek justice for the family of Eamon Collins, so brutally murdered, and join me in calling anyone with any evidence or information to pass that to the Police Service of Northern Ireland? Well, I, I think that in the course of the Haas discussions, we had a remedy to deal with those issues. Uh, unfortunately, thus far, we haven't had an agreement as to how we go forward. But certainly in, in, the, context, certainly in the context of, hopefully, us reaching an agreement on how we take that forward, there will be many cases, not just like Mr. Collins's case, many, many other cases out there that similarly, if the families wish, uh, need to be dealt with. And what we have provided and what is there for public consumption as a result of all of those who have read the Haas documents uh, will see that there's a menu of options out there for families. Uh, I, I don't know what the Collins family wish at this time. No doubt we will be appraised of that uh, in the course of the common period. But certainly, absolutely, there's a huge responsibility on all of us to put in place processes which will deal with all of these issues comprehensively right across the board and providing options for families who will decide that they either want uh, the truth, don't want prosecutions, or families who do seek prosecutions. It is our duty, it is our responsibility to support them all. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister how his office will be commemorating Holocaust Memorial Day? Well, I, I understand that our junior ministers will be representing the office of First and Deputy First Minister uh, at an event to take place shortly, and I think that's, that event is going to happen in the City Hall. I think it's very, very appropriate. I have myself and the First Minister in the past uh, attended Holocaust uh, commemorations. I think it's hugely important. I, mean, I, I, for one, am absolutely delighted that Adolf Hitler was defeated by the Allied forces during the course of the Second World War. I, I would hate to think that uh, we would be living in uh, sub subjugation of uh, uh, the Nazis here in the north or on the island of Ireland if he hadn't got his way. So yes, I do recognise the terrible suffering and uh, misery of uh, those Jewish people who lost their lives during the course of the uh, Holocaust. And in fact, myself and others from this assembly visited uh, Poland uh, and went to Auschwitz and saw at first hand the uh, terrible circumstances and conditions under which people lost their lives. 
thank you, Deputy First Minister, for his response and, and share his sentiments in relation to this important day. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister, however, would he agree that the best commemoration is action to eradicate any discrimination and prejudice of any kind uh, and seek his update in relation to our racial equality, sexual orientation and community relations strategies that would take that action here in Northern Ireland? Well, I, I think that the, the member probably knows better than anybody else that the challenges that face us in terms of how we go forward on these matters. Certainly from uh, my own perspective, I absolutely recognize that we need to live in a society where everybody is treated equally, where there is no discrimination uh, whatsoever. And that's our responsibility as legislators. Uh, that's our responsibility as political leaders to ensure that we live in a society where people feel valued, no matter what their sexual orientation, no matter what their religious beliefs, uh, and no matter what their political allegiances are. So there is a huge responsibility, but there are also huge difficulties in getting to a place where we can find uh, absolute agreement on all of those issues so that we can drive forward with a very unequivocal approach towards protecting the rights of citizens. Mike Nasbitt. Mr. Nasbitt. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Can I ask the Minister what uh, expert legal advice is available to Ministers uh, from lawyers employed within his department in the specific field of legislative competence? Well, uh, obviously in terms of the uh, DSO, we, we have uh, all sorts of legal advice available to the department. All departments have access to that uh, to that expertise, and all departments avail of that expertise on an ongoing basis. Uh, separate from that, we have the uh, we have the Attorney General and his particular expertise. So there's no shortage of uh, uh, legal advice for the purposes of ensuring that we push forward with legislation. Uh, obviously, uh, in terms of drafting legislation. Uh, that is a particular gift uh, which uh, not everybody uh, has uh, within them and therefore I think that uh, it does absolutely put pressure on those who are le legislation drafters uh, whenever we find ourselves in a scenario where there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, legislation to be processed. Mike Nasbitt. Uh, I, th I thank the, uh, the Minister. On the specific of the proposed amendment to the ill-fated planning bill, which would have brought some economic planning matters within OFM-DFM, uh, can I ask whether he's aware whether Sinn Féin and or the DUP sought advice on whether this amendment was legislatively competent uh, and whether that advice was that it was legal or whether that it was not legal? Well, I, I can assure the member that uh, neither the First Minister or, my, or myself would have pushed forward uh, on that project without having uh, legal advice. Uh, I think also it's important to state that the First Minister and myself have met with the Minister for the Environment in the course, uh, I think it was of November of last year. And it is our hope as a result of the ongoing discussions that are taking place that we can see uh, a way forward to ensure that we do bring uh, the planning bill before the Assembly. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The events of last week uh, and the uh, conviction for individuals for sending menacing texts has, or tweets has brought into focus the whole issue of cyberbullying. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister, is he confident that the actions of OFM DFM are making the cyber community a safer community? Well, I, I think that is you know, hugely important, and uh, particular difficulties and problems are being experienced by our young people. Uh, not just in the north, but all over uh, the island. I, I think that uh, you know, we're, we're all very conscious that we're uh, fast approaching Safer Internet Day, which I think is sometime in February. And I know that uh, an awful lot of uh, good work has been done by people like Jim Gamble and others, a uh, former member of uh, uh, the CEOPS, who all recognize the great dangers that the internet can present to our young people, can present great opportunities for our young people, but it does present, uh, on occasions, great dangers. 
So I think that we are very focused on the need to ensure that uh, working in conjunction with the uh, police service that we will uh, move forward on this issue as we learn more about uh, these situations. I mean, there was one particularly tragic situation in the Bala Buffet, County Donegal, uh, situation where two siblings uh, lost their lives to suicide uh, in the course of the last uh, couple of years. Uh, these are very tragic uh, situations, and it is incumbent upon all of us to address the issues uh, that present these dangers to our young people. And I think the best way to do that is to do it through a joint up approach, but working with the internet providers, working with the police, and working with the experts. Members, that concludes questions to the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister.